Well, you guys, happy Easter. I'm Barry Bowden, lead pastor here at ICC, and we welcome you to this joyful Easter celebration, the most wonderful day of the year, always for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 6 and 7 says this, as the angels spoke to the women who had come to the tomb and they found him gone, his body missing. Friday night, they had seen the one who they had believed in, the Son of God. The Word became flesh. As John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the one that they had given their life to follow, to believe in, to hope in, they had seen him taken, captive. They had seen him tried condemned, and condemned unto death, death on a cross. They had seen him not only beaten and flocked and mocked and scorned, but nailed to a cross through his hands and through his feet. They had watched as his body was gasping for air upon the cross. They had heard him utter those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And most importantly, tetelestai, which means it is finished. And they saw his body as they stood there, breathe his last breath, and slump into death. They saw the clouds cover in the midst of days, total darkness, the earth tremble. They had heard reports of the curtain in the temple being torn in two. They watched as the soldiers pierced him and blood and water flowed out. Then they lowered his body at the request of the Jews so that it would be done not on a high and holy day. They lowered his body. Joseph of Arimathea had come to take it and to put it with some others into a tomb. They waited for the holy days to pass. It had been two more days. Now Sunday morning and the women go to the tomb and they arrive only to find with great shock that the rock that had covered the entrance to the tomb had been moved and the body was gone. And to great wonder, they meet angels who say to them, he is not here. Why? Listen to what they say. For he has risen. As he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. He is not here. He is risen. Friends, I could stop right there and it would be one of the greatest sermons that I have ever preached. (laughs) I'm not going to do that. But what I've got to say to you today is not to add anything to what has already been said. It is to make known one of the most glorious realities. No, the most glorious reality. That your soul could ever comprehend. And that is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came. He lived among us perfectly, righteously, as a grace gift to provide perfect righteousness to all who would believe. The only one who never deserved to die because death is a consequence of sin, he chose to move toward Jerusalem into the place of his death. At any moment he could have stopped it, but he didn't. Because he loves you, he gave himself for you. Unto death, not just any death, Philippians 2 says death on a cross, And there on the cross, he took your place and my place. He stepped in as a substitute for the death that you deserve to die. And all the wrath of God was poured out on him. All the condemnation that your and my sin deserve was poured out on him completely until it was done. He gave himself unto death and he was buried in a grave in the place where we deserve to be, not only once but forever. But friends, after three days, the Son of God rose from the dead with victorious power. 
and he lives today, and he will come again. This is the good news of the gospel, and for all who believe and receive him, he gives the right for you and I to become children of God. Nothing of what we deserve, all of who he is and what he gives, that's why this is good news of God's love and God's grace. It's the best news in the entire world. Would you agree? He is not here, for he is risen. What is Easter all about? Some ask the question, okay, you guys, we grew up in the South. We're here in the South now. Even if you didn't grow up in the South, some of y'all came to the South. You're like, I'm here now. You're a Southerner, at least for the moment. It's a cultural thing to do, you know? We're all here. Y'all look good. I look good. I wear a coat. I never wear a coat to preach. <laughs> look at this. Shelly said, you look good. So I said, okay. So here I am. Some of y'all look the best I've seen you in a while. And that's no offense to any other day I've seen you. <laughs> no offense to any other day I've seen you. But you just look good. We understand the cultural tradition. Many of us as, who've grown up in a Christian home or church or our culture even, even though our society is moving a bit from that, we still understand Easter is a significant day. We have what we call Christers, Christmas and Easter, Christians. We understand that it's a day that we should get ourselves to church. You know, it's an important day. But what is Easter all about? Some of you have just heard me describe a little bit about what it's about, but I want to go a little bit further. I want to tell you today that Easter, yes, is about resurrection, but it's more than a resurrection principle. Easter about, is about a resurrected person. When we talk about Easter, it's, we're talking about, you know, I just came up here and I said, it, he is risen. And some of you said back, he is risen indeed. Where did you learn that? That's a saying. But friends, Easter is more than just about a resurrection saying. It's about a resurrected Savior. Easter is more than a resurrection doctrine, although we can build true statements around it. But friends, Easter is really about a resurrected deliverer. <laughs> Easter is more than a resurrection idea. Easter is about a resurrected individual. Ultimately, friends, what I'm saying here, something crucial for you to hear, it's what God's put on my heart to share today, and I'll share it and share it, and share it, because it is so important that you get it. I've been praying for you <laughs> that the Spirit of God would allow you to understand this Easter, that it's about more than just a tradition, it's about more than just a doctrine, it's about a person. It's, it's, it's about more than something for you to understand with your head, it's about a person to be experienced with your life. Easter We've got to change the question. I said earlier, it's what is Easter about? But really, it's who is Easter about? And Easter is about a person whose name is Jesus. A living Savior, Jesus Christ. Tim Keller, this week in the New York Times, which had an opportunity to read an article. He was interviewed by a New York Times reporter, and he was asked about how the resurrection has changed him and how he's reflecting on it differently this particular year because, I don't know if you know Tim Keller up in New York City, but he was diagnosed with cancer recently, and he's been walking through that suffering journey. If anybody has ever had cancer and your immediate vicinity, or maybe even you, you know what journey that is. But he described in the New York Times this week how this Easter, he's reflecting on the importance of experiencing Jesus. The experiential reality of his faith has, has come alive this year in a way that it had not before he describes how it's one thing to understand this with your head, but a whole other thing to experience Jesus with your life. He describes, and I quote, there is one sense in which if you believe in God, it's a mental abstraction. You believe with your head. 
But we must recognize that while our faith is rooted in truth and reality, there's an experiential side to our faith that must strengthen. It's one thing to believe that God loves you. It's another thing to actually feel his love. It's one thing to believe that he is present with you. But it's a whole other thing to actually experience his presence. With the resurrection, we celebrate that Jesus has made all things new. It's one thing to actually believe that Jesus makes all things new. It's a whole other thing to experience him making you new. Matthew 28, the verses we read, it says, He is not here, for he has risen. The point of the angels is not directing them to a doctrine or to a holiday or to a tradition. The angels are standing, pointing you to a person. His name is Jesus. He is risen. Do you know him? This changes everything. Literally, it changes everything. This one historical reality changes everything. And more than it's this changes everything, it's a he. (laughs) He changes everything. But friends, this morning, the message that I want to give to you, more than just everything, he can change you. He can change you. I want to briefly walk through a couple of characters in the scripture this morning. And I do mean briefly. Some of y'all don't believe me, but we'll see. (laughs) He changes everything. I just said that. So (laughs) you got to say it's possible, you know. (laughs) I'm even laughing at that joke. That was a good one. Um. The question I want you to wrestle with this morning is, do you have a personal experience with the living Savior, Jesus? The resurrection, yes, is for all, but it's for you. And I wonder this morning, knowing that it's not an idea, but it's an individual, knowing that it's not a principle, it's a person, he has risen Jesus is alive, as Jesus is alive today, how does his life today, how can you testify today that it has changed you? Because if it doesn't change us, then we've missed the point. He is alive, and it changes me, and it changes you. There's a couple of individuals I want to point your attention to. If you've got your Bibles, I would love for you to get them open today. If you don't, it's totally fine. We'll have the scripture here on the screen. But if you do have a Bible in your hand, or maybe a neighbor, you can get that open to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. The Gospel of John, chapter 20. There's a song that I used to sing. We sang it this morning, the chorus of it, written by the Gaithers. Anybody like the Gaithers other than my, my father-in-law and mother-in-law who are here today? Because he lives. Okay, don't keep singing. I didn't ask for that. Okay, it's hard not to. Just the first phrase. Because he lives. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Lives. Okay, good. Just trying out a new job. Um, because he lives. This morning, if you've got someone to take notes with, I would like for you to make a list. Because he lives, dot, dot, dot. Because he lives, dot, dot, dot. And what I want to do this morning is introduce you in a couple of chapters in the Gospels to some people who met the resurrected Jesus. The Bible gives us a picture of how Jesus wants to change us by introducing us to people who understood the resurrection as more than an idea. They understood the resurrection as an individual Jesus. 
They came face to face with this one who they saw put to death for sin, laid into a grave, but after three days, he rose. And this is more than an idea. These people came face to face with him in their life, and it changed them. And the Bible gives us account of these people because the Bible wants for us to meet this individual, Jesus, too this living Savior, and for him to change us in these ways. John chapter 20, verse 1, starting here in verse 1, and I read from the ESV. Now, the, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, "Uh, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. This is God's word. Because he lives. The first people who encountered Jesus were these women. Mary Magdalene, and we know from the other Gospels that the other Mary was there that we're well familiar with from the Scripture. One of the most amazing things happens. Can you imagine that? Can you just imagine, Michelle and I had an opportunity about three years ago to go to Israel, and we had the opportunity to actually go into the empty tomb where Jesus was laid. You know those moments in life where you don't expect to cry and you just start crying? That was us, okay? I think I held up the line a little bit too long. Oops, I'm sorry. But I was completely overwhelmed. Completely overwhelmed. Stepping into the tomb, it's like... The wind gets taken out of you just looking at the reality of the fact that that tomb is empty. I cannot imagine what Mary Magdalene and what Mary would have felt as they went that day with spices in hand to, to, to finish up the preparation process for Jesus' body at burial and they arrive and the tomb is empty. First fear grips their heart thinking the body has been taken away but as we've talked about already, everything changes. What's so amazing is in the midst of Mary's weeping, literally, she's overcome with tears. 
Where is Jesus? Where have they taken him? And all of a sudden, she hears one call out. Thinking it's a gardener, and then realizing this one who's calling out is not just some unnamed person. This is Jesus himself. Can you imagine the moment where you hear Jesus, the living Jesus, the one who you saw crucified and suddenly calling your name? Mary. The same living Jesus today calls your name. And he beckons you to come and to see. He's alive. The only right response is to fall on your face like Mary did. Oh, my Lord, my teacher, happen. Overwhelmed with fear turned to joy, amazement, worship. Running off. Can, can you believe? Ah, he's living. Essentially is her report to the disciples. Can you imagine as she got there? But for her, because he lives, everything changes. Let's make our list. Confirmation of his salvation. Here's one who, in Mary Magdalene, we have one who was oppressed by demons. We had one who had lived her life in fear, lived her life in slavery to sin, who had experienced forgiveness and had experienced freedom. She had put her hope in Jesus and she had dedicated her whole life to one who had promised to rescue her out of the bondage that she had lived in, out of the brokenness that had ensued because of her choices and also the choices of others. She had hoped in Jesus. He had promised salvation. And she had stood and watched as this one who she had hoped in was crucified and laid into a tomb. She's showing up to pay her honor with spices, preparing his body for burial, and yet she gets encountered by the man himself. Can you imagine the sense of, it's all real, <laughs> that she would have felt? I put all of my hope in you, and you're really who you say you were. You are the Savior. You are God. The unbelievable sense of confirmation and assurance of all that she had hoped in, all that she had hoped in came true. Assurance of all of his promises, secondly. Every, listen, friends, when Jesus rose from the dead, one of the things that absolutely happened, Romans chapter 1 talks about it, he was absolutely confirmed to be the Savior of all who would believe by the power which God raised him from the dead. Friends, dead people don't come back to life. Last time I checked, y'all know what I'm talking about? Can you imagine every, every question about whether or not this guy was truly the Savior answered from his, at his resurrection from the dead. He is who he said he is. He is the Savior. But more than that, all that he has promised, everything that he has said, friends, is true. It confirmed all of his promises. And friends, today it confirms all that he has promised that's yet to be. It will come true. He is Savior. He is a promise giver and a promise keeper. I wonder today... I know there are so many of us who have hoped in Jesus. We have heard his word. We have heard his promise. We have heard his offers and we have put all of our hope in Jesus. And friends, today, if you are saved, 
Today, God wants to remind you to look at the empty tomb and remember that your hope is not in vain. He is who he says he is. He is the Savior. It is good that you hope in him. Some of us today are clinging on to his promises. It's all we have. And sometimes it feels hard to persevere in faith, does it not? But today, God invites us to look at an empty tomb and behold a living Savior and to remember that everything that he promised is absolutely true. It is good to hope in his promises. He is who he says he is, and his words are true because he lives. Amen. But there's also another character there, not just Mary Magdalene, but Mary. St. Mary over in John 11, do you remember? As she was weeping with her sister, Lazarus has died. You all remember the story? And, and Jesus comes and he weeps too. And then they come to him with like, hey, where were you? Why'd you let this happen? And Jesus speaks a word to Mary and to Martha. And he helps them to know that he is the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in him, though they die, yet they will live. Who is this? Who's coming to reverse death itself? Not just with his own body, but he's promising that those who hope in him and believe in him will themselves, though their bodies die, one day be raised to newness of life. You have to wonder, they're leaning in to believe, but you have to wonder at some point still there's like, how can this be? Can you imagine the day that Jesus comes to Mary <laughs> face to face and calls her name? Because he lives, number three, life after death. The assurance of his promise and the guarantee that life comes even in death. Because Jesus lives, the scriptures say he's the first fruit of those who will come after him. Mary would have absolutely known that what he had promised related to the fact that he's, he can bring life after death. It's absolutely true. There's hope for the renewal of all things. There's healing for all that is broken. Friends, I've been walking through a season with our elder team where, man, the last two years have felt especially broken. Death has been a reality in our church at times. There's other, many of us in this room who are grieving because on a day like today, we remember those who are not here. There's many in this room, even right now, who have a diagnosis and you're unsure of where it's leading. All of us understand to one degree or another the brokenness that is in our own lives and in our world. And we feel a yearning for things to be made new. And we long for a hope beyond death. And friends, I'm here to tell you that today we celebrate a risen Savior whose name is Jesus. And this Savior is one who promises that for all who come and all who believe, though you die, yet you will live. That death doesn't have the final word in your life. He does. And his resurrection from the grave gives us assurance that we, as we believe in him, and others, as they have believed in him, though they die, we and they will live. Aren't you grateful for a resurrected Savior? And that all the broken and sad 
and troubling things in this world will one day be made new. There is coming a day when we will hear his voice. Behold, I've made all things new. And he will wipe tears from our eyes. As he calls our name, we will see with our own faces he lives, he lives, he lives. And he literally has changed everything. Amen? If you keep reading in the Gospel of John, we encounter another as we look at verse 19. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them in his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Well, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Not only did Jesus show up to Mary Magdalene, to Mary, who I think many of us probably relate to today, but he also showed up to Thomas, who others of us might relate to today. Thomas, the guy who goes, mm, not so sure. Like, I'm going to need to uh, have a little bit more proof here. <laughs> there are many of us today who I believe are seeking, wondering, could this be true? <laughs> is this all a made-up thing? Do they just hallucinate? What is, what, is this some big conspiracy scheme? Like, what's going on here? And I love seekers. I see myself in seekers, wanting to know the truth, not scared to ask questions, even hard ones. But ultimately, friends, what Thomas needed was more than just an answer. He needed a personal experience with the Lord. Because he lives, we see with Thomas that Jesus is willing to offer himself to those who ask questions. Aren't you grateful? And he provides answers to our doubts. There's a difference of doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a problem of the intellect. Person wants to believe but has questions. Somebody who would say, I, I can't believe because it seems that there's just too many problems. Unbelief is not a problem of the head, but a problem of the heart. Unbelief will not believe no matter what it sees. What we see here with Jesus is as the resurrection, his resurrection from the dead, which 
I would be glad, or any of our elders would, to, to walk you through the historical reality, the answers to questions of the fact that he really did rise from the dead. He did. It's historically verifiable. But what I love is that Jesus shows back up to the one who has questions, and he offers himself. And he says, hey, you have questions, I have answers. Look, put your hands here. Feel, see. He's inviting you to come and to understand and to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that he is who he says he is. And he provides answers to your doubts with the fact that he is risen from the dead. And he provides confidence in his truth with the reality of his resurrection from the dead. Jesus offers himself to you. But ultimately, friends, as he offers himself to you, he also comes and he speaks to your heart. And he says, here I am, alive from the dead. I offer you answers for your head, but now I'm looking into your heart. And I'm asking, will you believe? Jesus invites your doubt. But when answers are provided, specifically on this day, when you hear of his resurrection from the grave, at the end of the day, the question is, will you allow him to change your heart? Will you, like Thomas, Come to a point of bending your knee and prostrating yourself before him to the degree that you say, truly, you are not just the Lord, but my Lord. (laughs) And not just a God, but my God. Jesus offers himself to you. Again, the resurrection, it's an idea that we can talk through. It's a doctrine that we can explain. But ultimately, friends, It's more than an idea, it's an individual, more than a doctrine, he's a deliverer. And he comes to you, alive from the dead, and asks you, will you now believe? He changes everything. As we keep reading in the story, John chapter 21, verses 1 and, and 2, we turn the chapter and we read that after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, "Uh, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. 
This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow The third person that Jesus encounters, I believe, is a lot like us today. And what I am trying to lead you to do is understand how the resurrected Savior changes everything, including you. The third person I want to point your attention to is Peter. Because imagine where Peter was at this point in life. In fact, we know kind of where he was. Just before the crucifixion, Peter had turned his back on Jesus, so to speak. Peter had denied him. Not just once, not just twice, but three times in his very presence. When given an opportunity to have faith and trust Jesus and to be faithful unto Jesus, to walk in the way you needed to walk, he, he screwed it up. He completely failed. He sinned against the Lord. He disowned the Lord. No, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of his. At one point, Jesus looked him in the eye. The rooster crowed. You can imagine in the appearances up to this point, group appearances, Peter might have thought, the resurrection is for others, but certainly not for me. <laughs> I'm so let down. I'm so, I feel so rejected feeling despair, self-hatred, useless, beating himself up, feeling like a total failure. He's betrayed Jesus. He's been unfaithful. He's denied him one more time, screwing it up. It's all I ever do, just screw it up. No more hope for me. How could he ever forgive me? Excluding himself, distancing himself, Many of us understand this with others, more importantly with God. Our own sin, our own denial, our own turning our back, we get this. We are Peter. We are Peter. I'm going fishing. What's that about? Going back to what he did before he knew Jesus. Thinking he's so failed that there's no way he could continue forward. (laughs) Until out on the boat. How did he know it was Jesus? Because before Jesus called Peter, he was fishing. Remember? Same thing happened. Jesus is coming back to him in the same way. Overwhelming catch of fish, and they recognize it is the Lord. You could see Peter's excitement, his hopefulness, even though he may on the inside still wonder what his future holds with Jesus and his ministry, he's leaping out of the boat, taking off his clothes, running toward Jesus. And they get to the shore. And interestingly, what does Jesus have prepared? A charcoal fire. When's the last time Peter saw a charcoal fire? 
When's the last time he smelled that smell? The moment of his denial. Jesus is bringing him back to the place of his failure. Because Jesus has got a lesson for Peter. (laughs) Jesus is no longer in the grave. He's alive from the dead. And because he's alive, it changes everything. And it changes Peter. Peter gets pulled aside by Jesus. Again, the resurrected Savior calls our name. He calls our name Mary, Thomas, Peter. Come, come to me. And Jesus takes Peter back through his sin. Oh, how painful it is to have to deal with our brokenness and sin. Would you agree? Not one time, not two times, but three times Jesus asked the question, why? Because Peter denied not once, not twice, but three times. We have to deal with our sin in full. Jesus takes him back to his sin. But then overwhelmingly, Peter gets the moment, experiences the newness of what the resurrection is all about. Because Peter experiences Jesus looking at him. You remember when Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. (laughs) In other words, Satan is going to mess with you, but you're going to see me raised from the dead one day, and you're going to understand it's not about you, Peter. It's about me. It's about my power. It's about my purpose. It's about my love. It's about my plan. It's about my grace. It is about my heart for you. Peter, here I am. And my grace for you is greater than your sin. Here I am, and my power is greater than the power of Satan. Here I am. It's not about your faith as much as it is about my faithfulness unto you. Peter, do you love me? Here I am. I love you. Praise God for a resurrected Savior. Amen? Because he lives, friends, forgiveness for all of our sins. Because he lives, restoration of all of our brokenness. And because he lives, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace Upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace for you now and forevermore. He pours out his grace. He gives and he gives and he gives out of what he has done for you. I wonder how many Peters there are today. And I wonder if you know he calls your name. I wonder if you know that because he lives, you can be forgiven. Like, it's for real. You can be restored. And you can have the promise of his grace now and forever. Your sin does not have the last word, friend. His grace does. Your failures do not have the last word, friend. His victory does. Your denial does not have the last word, friend. His acceptance does. Your brokenness does not have the last word, friends. His restoration does. Praise God for a living Savior whose name is Jesus. Amen. I close the message today with the final character that I want to point your attention to. And it's the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 22, verses 6 to 7, describes Paul stands before and testifies that he was on his way And he drew near to Damascus about noon. A great light from heaven suddenly shone around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. 
And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Paul later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 speaks of this when he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which, I re- which you received, in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it was I or they, they So we preach, and so you believed. I close by pointing your attention to one final individual, Paul, who encountered the living Jesus. And I point your attention to Paul because I said at the beginning of the message today that God can change you. And Paul is one of the most incredible stories of radical life change. Because he lives, friends, radical life change is possible. Paul went from being all about himself, consumed with religion, even to the degree that he was persecuting the followers of Jesus, to the point that after he encountered the resurrected Lord, he came to see and believe for himself (laughs) who Jesus really is, and that all he says is really true, and that ultimately (laughs) he needed to give his own life to this one who is the only Savior for all who would believe. Paul experienced such radical life change, friends, and you can too. God opened the eyes of his heart, and his whole life shifted, and his priorities We're redefined. Friends, because Jesus lives, our priorities in life are completely redefined. He said, I delivered to you of first importance. In other words, what is not most important in life anymore is whether or not you pass your test, it's whether or not you have a lot of friends, whether or not you move into that neighborhood you dream about, whether or not you have enough money in your bank account for retirement. It's not about what people think of you, how much you can add to your resume, how successful you can be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could just pile on. What's most important in your life now is your relationship with Jesus Christ. He is your priority. Of first importance, that there is one who loved me and gave himself for me. This changes everything. And it gives us a purpose that really matters. There are a lot of people today who are here who are looking for purpose in life. God has made you for purpose. But friends, we've got to recognize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us a true and enduring purpose to our life. There is a purpose that we must and are invited to live for that is beyond the here and now. A purpose to live in such a way to make Jesus known through our lives, here and among all the nations. A purpose to see him known 
and praised. Paul went from being all about himself to becoming all about Jesus, to the point of even greatest suffering that is detailed in the New Testament. What changed? What set this guy on fire? What would lead him to literally give his own life for this new way? An encounter with one who is alive from the dead, whose name is Jesus. The same can be true of you. Friends, I'm here to say the question is not what is Easter all about? It's who is Easter all about? And the answer to that question is Jesus, a living Savior. He has risen, the angel said, and this changes everything. No, not this changes everything. It's he changes everything. And by everything, I want to say he can change you. Today, our living Savior Jesus comes and he looks you in the eye and he calls your name. I don't know today if you're maybe like Mary Magdalene wondering, can you be certain of his salvation? Can you be assured of his promise? Maybe you're like Mary, wondering, is it true that this life is not over at death? Is it true that there can be hope beyond the grave? Is it true that there can be a restoration of all things hope in the midst of brokenness? Jesus calls your name, and he offers you himself. (laughs) Maybe you're like Thomas, Genuine questions. But Jesus stands today showing you himself and looks into your hearts going, what more do you need? I'm inviting you to surrender. I am who I say I am. Come, put your hands here and believe. Maybe you're like Peter. Feeling like sin has just so overwhelmed you. Feeling like your failures define you. Like your future is just completely screwed up because of your past. Wondering if redemption is possible and Jesus calls your name. He calls your name. He asks you to deal with your sin, but he also asks you to know his grace. He asks you to recognize his victory and his faithfulness unto you. Will you receive his love for you and let his grace define you? Maybe you're like Paul and you're just living for yourself. You're just completely consumed with self, self, self. Reluctant to believe, passionate for your own purposes. But today, Jesus comes (laughs) And he calls your name and he goes, hey, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? And who are you living for? You see, it's me. This is about me. Come and surrender. You're blind, but I can make you see. And I can give you a passion and a purpose that really matters. Today, Jesus, friends, he's alive. Come and see and hear him call your name. Let him change you. Father, thank you for your grace upon grace. I do pray, God, that as we consider Easter this year, that we would consider who you are, what you've done, and that your life from the grave truly changes everything, and it changes us. Wherever we are today, I pray that we would hear you calling our name and offering yourself risen from the dead that we would know that in you is life. Holy Spirit, would you breathe life? Would you awaken souls even now? Would you save? Would people be turning toward you? If you're here today and you've never believed upon Jesus, even now, you can turn from yourself and turn from your sin and you could acknowledge your brokenness and need. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you, you could just say, oh God, I'm sorry. I need your salvation. I look at you, Jesus. I see what you've done in your life and your death. 
for the forgiveness of my sin and your resurrection from the grave for new life and I believe upon you Jesus I hope in you I put all my hope in you oh God would you make me new even now you can you can just turn toward Jesus and he can give you new life for those of us who have been saved even now the Holy Spirit can touch your heart and renew you in the joy of your salvation 